Hello! Welcome to another episode of our video series, sponsored by the Duke Center for Eating Disorders. Today we're going to talk about the origin story of sensory superpowers, a feature often seen in individuals who have Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, or ARFID. Let's watch and see what happens. Hey, my mom made a bunch of cupcakes. Anybody want a cupcake? Me! Me! Me. Those look delicious! Hey, Mark, how come you never eat anyone else's food? Yeah, Mark, you always eat the same thing for lunch. How come? And you never want to sleep over, and you never come to birthday parties. Do you not like us or something? No, no, no. That's not it at all. I'm just so tired of talking about it, and nobody even understands it if I do try. I sure wish that a superhero could swoop in and make everybody understand. Did someone call for the great Captain Disgusto? I'm here to explain the meaning of Mark's food avoidance to mere mortals who simply do not understand. Oh, thank goodness you're here. The great Captain Disgusto. I'm so tired of trying to explain myself to people, and then I can't seem to do it in a way that anybody gets what I'm going through. Can you help? Why, of course I can. Mere mortals, please gather round while I tell you the ancient story of how sensory superpowers, and from them, Mark's food avoidance came to be. Once upon a time, there was a group of people that liked every type of food. No matter what the master chef made, no matter how experimental, utterly disgusting, or vile it was to look at, these people ate it with gusto and enjoyed every bite. My goodness, this green goop is delicious. This slime just seems to run down the back of my throat. I barely even need to chew. I agree. I can't get enough of the slimy texture. Why, if I laugh while eating, it actually comes back up out of my nose. How delightful. Two individuals, however, a man named Germ and a woman named Free, were a bit different from the rest of the all-accepting mere mortals. They seemed to notice things that the other individuals did not. For example, they noticed when the green slime was a bit thicker than usual or smelled a bit funnier than usual. When they were walking through the woods with their families, they were the first to notice a brown spot on a leaf, the hidden butterfly, and the nest of bluebird eggs. Their parents, afraid that their children's sensory superpowers would upset the chef, taught them to hide their skills, pretending to like the green slime shakes and perform fake smiles during the jovial feasts. They were very secretive about this because they didn't want the chef, who had such good intentions, to be offended by their seemingly strange sensory superpowers. As a result of this, Germ and Free would often go on long walks in the woods after a meal together and get their own nourishment from a French fry hut hidden deep within the woods run by a mystical gnome. Well, time passed and all seemed to be well in the land of the all-accepting mere mortals. You see, these people were quite content and appreciative of just about everything. How delightful life must have been then. However, as with all things that seem too good to be true, this period of bliss was rather short-lived. Unbeknownst to the all-accepting mere mortals, a blight had fallen upon the crop of green slime that year, rendering it dangerous and poisonous. Of course, the chef, also being an all-accepting mere mortal, did not notice this and went on preparing his green slime due to mark the beginning of the spring festival. Well, it just so happened that on this particular night, Germ and Free had lost track of time and were munching on fries and chatting up the wood gnome at the secret french fry shack. Meanwhile, back in the village, the chef was serving all the mere mortals the contaminated green slime, which they all munched on happily. When 
Jerem and Free finally returned to the village, they were shocked at what they saw. All the villagers were unconscious all around the dinner table from eating the contaminated stew. Jerem and Free quickly used their sensory superpowers to try to investigate what could have happened. In moments, they smelled the contaminated stew. They summoned the mystical gnome who sprinkled all the villagers with magic dust that made them puke out all the contaminated stew. When the villagers finally regained consciousness, Jerem and Free decided it was time to tell them their story. The mere mortals, including the chef, were so thankful for their sensory superpowers that they set up a training school where Jerem and Free could further sharpen their senses of vision, taste, smell, and texture. Of course, by this time, Jerem and Free had spent so much time together that they had fallen in love and decided to get married. So you see, mere mortals, both I, myself, the great Disgusto, and your friend, Mark, are the descendants of Jerem and Free. Mark and I come from a distinguished line of descendants with extreme sensory superpowers who are on a quest to find the most flawless and delicious French fry in the world and protect the species from contaminated green slime. Well, wow, Mark, that's so cool. I had no idea. Jeez, Mark, that is complicated. Mark, we can go out and have french fries in the woods whenever you want. Thanks, you guys. And thanks so much to you, the great Captain Disgusto. It feels really great to be understood. You got it, Mark. I'll let you know when I find the perfect chicken tender. It's my latest quest. And there you have it, folks. Sensory superpowers can have very ancient and adaptive origins, even though they may not make a lot of sense in our current food environment. The important lesson here, be curious and accepting of everyone's origin story. And always know where to get a good fry. <laughs>